tonight. There's a lot of incoming fire, so these guys are using RPGs to try to push the ISIS fighters further back. Do you come to events like this because you already like the person? I'm shopping for a candidate. I feel like if your brick and mortar is dying, you suck. The first six funerals for the 50 victims of the Christchurch mosque shootings were held today, five days after the attack. Police have only identified 30 bodies so far and say they've been working methodically to avoid mistakes that would make it harder to convict the killer. But the delay is adding to families' grief as Islamic rituals generally call for burial within a day. My concern around the 24-hour burial period has been the top of my mind, and so I do want to learn lessons from this. <laughs> A woman claiming to be a descendant of two slaves has sued Harvard, accusing it of profiting off their photos, believed to be the earliest taken of American slaves. Tamara Lanier's lawsuit says she's the rightful owner of the daguerreotypes, commissioned by a professor in 1850 to sell his racist theories. Harvard declined to comment. Radovan Karadzic, the former Bosnian Serb leader convicted of war crimes, including genocide, for planning the massacre of more than 8,000 Muslim men and boys, appealed his 40-year sentence from the UN, only to get life. Not that it'll make a huge difference. He's 73 years old. Disney closed its $71 billion deal to buy up the entertainment side of Fox, giving the Magical Kingdom a take of 40% of global ticket sales for movies that can now mix in The Simpsons and The X-Men and create a whole new world of potential Hollywood sequels. Back in 2017, the White House said the deal could be a, quote, great thing for jobs. It's actually expected to lead to 3,000 people being laid off. It's been more than a month since the battle started to retake the town of Baguz. From gun positions high above what remains of the Caliphate, US-backed Kurdish and Arab militias known as the Syrian Democratic Forces or SDF have been raining down fire on ISIS. <laughs> But in the battle to end the Islamic State, this last portion is proving the hardest. These guys are trying to take out the fighters with 50 caliber machine guns. They've actually had to stop the heavy artillery bombardment because SDF soldiers are now getting so close. But the final victory is now in sight. The fact they've held out so long has surprised everyone. <laughs> Adnan Afrin is an SDF commander. He's been fighting the Islamic State for more than five years. Do you feel like this is the moment that, that it's going to be all over? Afrin is confident his forces are on the verge of history. What do you know about who's still inside and what kind of preparations they've made for this last stand? Since 
The SDF says that in the past few days, they've managed to push ISIS out of most of Baghouz into a tiny piece of land by the Iraqi border. You can hear the sniper rounds whistling past. There's a lot of there's a lot of gunfire still. ISIS is very close to this position. There's fighters in there. Yeah. Still. They have a flag on top of the building. And they have weapons. Yes. They have a lot of weapons. So they're hitting you with missiles too. Yeah. Even now, there's still yeah. fighters. Yeah. So, so there's a lot of incoming fire, so these guys are using RPGs to try to push the ISIS fighters further back. As we're hurried out of Sniper Alley, we pass the area where ISIS women and children were recently living and find remnants of what they left behind. What is this? Of In a rare view from the air, you get a sense of why this battle has taken so long. Even in recent days, the fighters apparently still had fuel and the SDF had to try and avoid women and children still inside. This ISIS video shows the intensity of the fight from inside. This week, they've recaptured most of these streets. The SDF has had to move cautiously. 60,000 people have streamed out during the siege so far. By night, the sky over Baghouz is lit up by explosions. What do The SDF, along with US forces, have been stepping up the bombardment. <laughs> What do you think it's like to be inside right now? It's hard to believe anything could withstand this. But for right now, ISIS is still clinging on to this very last corner of the caliphate. Senator, hi. Uh, I'm Evan with Vice News. I saw you. You are say, not a local guy. I'm not a local guy, but, but I wanted to know what it's like to do the questions like in this gaggle versus the questions you get from the voters. Well, the voters tend to ask about things like floods that you guys might think are boring. They don't think they're boring because they could like lose their basement. Then I think maybe you guys should learn a few things from these uh, kind of pseudo town hall meetings here because what's on people's mind um, is not always what's on the news. Challenge accepted, Senator. We attended multiple events in Davenport, Iowa, to listen to what voters are actually asking about. It wasn't a huge sample size, but it was telling. Sir, there in the back in the sweater, I always like to call on people with sweaters. <laughs> <laughs> we have a, uh, a situation at the border that the president has determined it's a crisis. Mm -hmm. We have people from Central America coming asking for asylum. 
How would you respond to that? I think we do need security at the border. I've always supported that. But you have to be smart about it, right? Uh, and what he's proposing is this seven billion, eight billion dollar wall, right? That is not the answer. Why did you ask that question? In our congregation, we, we are what's known as a sanctuary congregation, which means we are willing and able to uh, take somebody in and protect them from authorities uh, who is in danger of deportation due to immigration status. So we care a lot about immigration problems and immigrants in general. But like, do you come to events like this because you already like the person? No, I'm shopping. I'm shopping for a candidate. I have no front runner at this time. Okay, uh, um, in a couple hours, I'm going to go see Cory Booker downtown. So we'll see what he has to say. All right, I'm going to go to the gentleman in the back. Yes, sir. I have a question about your um, ideas on prison reform. In lieu of certain states trying to make weed a recreational drug, how do you feel about nonviolent um, criminal offenders? We have presidential candidates and Congress people and senators that now talk about their marijuana use almost as if it's funny. But meanwhile, in 2017, we had more arrests for marijuana possession in this country than all the violent crime arrests combined. And what happens to people who are arrested for marijuana? First of all, who gets arrested? Poor people. And way disproportionately people of color. So we need to start talking about what I call restorative justice in our system. Why did you ask that question? I know guys that have that type of stuff on their record, went to school with them, hung out with them. You know, um, my high school is just up the street. I knew guys that, you know, were selling in the parking lot, you know, because you know, mom was working 17 jobs. Well, that's an exaggeration, but you get the point. So you were, you're at a Booker event. Is this, is, is he your guy? Or are you looking at other candidates? What are you thinking? Um, it's too early to decide. Um, I think he's a really good candidate. I think he's a strong candidate. We'll see how everything plays out. Um, if I were to go with someone currently, I, would go with Joe Biden. You're the third um, separate Iowan today <laughs> to tell me. I'm going to events with candidates. People are coming out of the events and saying, what I like is Joe Biden. Why? <laughs> because Joe is tied to Obama. I'm not saying that uh, Cory Booker has no chance, but if I were to pick someone right here, right now, this early in the race, I would go with, with Joe Biden. I love being in Iowa. I gotta tell you why because you are the first in the nation caucus. You take that responsibility so seriously. You want to meet every candidate many times, ask them questions directly. And the truth is, that is what our democracy was meant to be. So now I will answer all your questions and I will get up here so I can see your faces. I wanted to ask you about your opinion on a woman's right to choose and reproductive rights. I understand people have deeply held religious beliefs. But those who are Christians among us, one of the most important tenets of Christianity is that you come to your faith by free will. There is nowhere in the Bible that tells you you must impose your faith on other people as a Christian. It's early. Campaigns are still figuring out what voters are looking for. And it's not that people aren't worried about their flooded basements. It's that the people that I talk to seem more worried about beating President Trump next year. What does your pin mean? It stands for impeach the motherfucker already. Okay. So this year, which candidates have you seen? Elizabeth Warren, Kamala Harris, Cory Booker, um, Amy Klobuchar, wow. and, and Kirsten, and then I saw Pete Buttigieg um, via live stream. Do you have any sort of front runner or favorite at this point? I do not. Um, last time I started out very idealistic and this year my strategy is going to be different. We are going to, um, I believe, support the candidate that has the best chance of winning on a national scale. Yeah, I don't know him. Uh, he's a whack job. There's no question about it. But I really don't know him. He, uh, I think he's doing a tremendous disservice to a wonderful wife. Kellyanne is a wonderful woman. 
That was President Trump doubling down on his criticism of George Conway. After calling Conway a stone cold loser and husband from hell during his morning Twitter calisthenics. So let's dissect all that for those of you who don't speak inside the Beltway and have been wisely tuning this story out. Mr. Kellyanne, as Trump puts it, is George Conway. He's a prominent DC lawyer who happens to be married to White House counselor and Trump's 2016 campaign manager, Kellyanne Conway. The Conways have been married almost two decades and have four kids together. They're both longtime conservatives, but their marriage has become a proxy war for Trump defending Republicans and never Trump Republicans. Now, it was George who actually introduced Kellyanne to Trump, creating this bizarre DC love triangle. But as the Trump administration began to do its thing, George Conway became one of its most prominent Republican Twitter dissidents. He's been attacking Trump publicly and making things weird for his wife almost the entire time she's worked at the White House. This week, it was his tweets questioning the president's mental health, which Kellyanne brushed off as usual. No, I don't share those concerns. And I was getting, I have four kids and I was getting them out of the house this morning before I got here so, and talked to the president about substance. So I may not be up to speed on all of them. Now, in an amazing show of discipline, Trump had pretty much refrained from responding until those mental health tweets. Then George told the Washington Post that the president's incompetence is maddening to watch and that the tweeting keeps him from screaming at Kellyanne about it. The Conway's relationship used to represent a very normal part of DC. Two conservatives married with kids who seem to have made a good life for themselves in law and politics. What these two have going on now could also be considered kind of normal for DC. When so many people in a town work in politics, people find love even amidst policy disagreements. George Conway actually summed it up pretty nicely on Yahoo's Skullduggery podcast. If I had a nickel for everybody in Washington who disagreed with their spouse about something that happens in this town, I wouldn't be on this podcast. I'd be probably on a beach somewhere. What's not typical is for a couple this prominent to feud this publicly and for the president of the United States to pick a side. Now, the routine's been a hit on the DC party circuit. Sally Quinn, a DC journalist and the widow of famed Washington Post editor Ben Bradley, knows that circuit well. I asked her about the role Kellyanne plays in the DC social scene. So everywhere she goes, Donald Trump is persona non grata. But she, because of her closeness to the president, uh, is invited everywhere. I mean, particularly by embassies and, you know, sort of official things. Partly because a lot of the people in this administration don't go out. It, social climbing is impossible in this administration because you start making out with one person and then suddenly they're gone. But Kellyanne just keeps on trucking and um, she goes out everywhere. She's everywhere. Look, I'm not a marriage counselor and I don't know what goes on in the Conway home. What I do know is there will be a lucrative book, movie, or pseudo reality TV deal waiting for Mrs. Conway whenever she decides to leave the White House's current reality show. And whichever side emerges from the battle for the GOP's future, at least one half of the Conways can say they were on the winning team. So while the Beltway gossips giggle into their cheap Chardonnay, Mrs. and Mr. Kellyanne Conway might end up with a champagne laugh. So yeah, I mean, this is like every category of vintage you could ever imagine. Hoodies, button-ups, denim shorts, flannels, holy shit, you name it, they got it. Catch the swell, homie. Uh-uh. Really? Damn, this is a really dope Snoopy. Are those Nike? Yeah. Grab those, I like those. Honestly, a brand could not pay for that good of a look. I love this. I think it's got a great look. It's really good. It's sequins and tassels. 90s, I don't know. This is this might have been a vibe. It's not like everyone thinks where you can just come through and you're like, all right, uh-huh. got a bunch <laughs> of really great polo and Tommy, let's go and pay for it and I'm done. It's like, no, actually, like this is all a bunch of bullshit. Sean Wotherspoon and his business partners spend hours at rag houses like this one, digging for old clothes. They're sourcing product for their world famous vintage streetwear company, Round Two. Cameras aren't usually welcome here, but we got a rare invitation to a treasure hunt for t-shirts your dad might have worn. Wow. Heater. Is it? Heat. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you just that's picked a good a, one. you just picked like a oh, you know, a couple hundred it's dollars. It's Madonna. Shirt. It's a Madonna Torsha. Yeah. That's yeah, yeah, that's yeah. huge. From that's where? a good one. That's fire. 
This one's nice. what? This one's uh, two stretch. This down. is 1990. But yeah, I mean, this is between, you know, like what, 150 and two or something like that? Even Easy. though it's got yeah. like stain. Yeah, this is fine. Mm -hmm. So yeah. this is like, in our vintage store, it's like, this is just like kind of what people want. Knowing exactly which qualities makes an old t-shirt valuable requires experience and instinct. This is also it's like, not uh, cheap you know, or easy either. To even walk into this rag house, you have to be ready to spend all day here and drop a minimum of $500. Do you want to price this out, I guess? Yep. Cool. Yep, yep. See, let's see the new workout here. We got these uh, sweatshirts here at 18 inch. Cool. $30. Okay. You know, it's yeah. very fair, right? $25. Yeah. $25. Yeah. That's great. T shirt for $25, you know what I mean? Whatever you think is. $50 on the Madonna. Okay. Today, they left with $2,000 worth of what might seem like a random assortment of old tees but they're confident they'll make at least a 30% profit on each one. Thank you, brother. I'm stoked, yo. Thank, Thank you, you, man. Thank, Thank you. Man. Thank, right. you. Thank, Thank you for your business. Yeah. Thank you for your business, yeah. guys. Sean and the guys can anoint a T-shirt with value because they've been getting their hands dirty this way for a decade. The first round two store was a 10 by 10 square foot storage unit in Richmond, Virginia. When they first got into vintage, it was just to find rare clothes for themselves. They soon realized they could turn their own personal taste into cash. Next, they opened a 700 square foot brick and mortar. And since then, the brand has expanded a lot. This is kind of like the round two block, right? It's sweet, yeah, yeah, it's our little monopoly. It's our village, the round right. two village, yeah. Usually people come to the main store first, then they'll go hit up the vintage store, then they'll go to the merch store last, grab some like souvenirs and some merchandise like that. It's a cool block, you know? It's a lot of fun. So how many stores do you have now? Um, okay, so... <laughs> you don't even know. We have three here. One in New York, but we're opening another one in New York in March. So I won't count it yet. Um, two in South Beach, one in Virginia, seven. Yeah. And how many people do you employ now? I don't do payroll. I don't know. We might have like 50 employees, though. It's a little crazy. At a time when the retail apocalypse is causing apparel stores to close at record rates, Sean is opening more without a functioning website. Brick and mortar stores are dying. Yeah. Everything's going online. How do you think you've been able to go against the I could not feel the, the opposite. Yeah. Like, you're saying that, and in my mind, I'm like, is this true? Is this really happening? I just don't believe it. I feel like if your brick and mortar is dying, you suck. I think now consumers love to have a story. They love to have something to talk about, love to feel like a part of something. When you go to a store to shop, you leave with like 10 stories. What they are selling online is the in-store experience via YouTube. Welcome to the new store. Customers find out about the store from the show, which is basically pawn stars for rare Supreme, Nike, and of course, vintage. They've been filming themselves for six years now, and the hour-long episodes have an impressive average watch time of 15 minutes. It's this, along with the brand's combined 1.6 million Instagram followers, that's created the hype to sustain the storefronts. Hype that has kids flying in from all across the globe. I flew all the way from Sydney, Australia, and he had time, like five minutes of his time, to have a chat with me. Like. Do you feel like you kind of know him because you've been following him online? I honestly felt like I was talking to a celebrity. Hello. Where are you from? Well, I'm from Mexico. Why are you shopping in round two? Oh, well, round two seems very special to me because it captures that vintage feeling very well. It's just such a good feeling that you don't get at a regular retail clothes. I feel like these things have a history behind them, and that's good. People do well who are in this kind of niche area of the kind of vintage yeah. market. What do you think of the elements that took it beyond that? We opened in 2013, so that was like, there wasn't many stores like ours, and the stores you could go to that were, you know, ran by younger dudes, everyone was an asshole. So we saw that and we were like, you know what, when we open, let's just like be as nice as possible. You have worn these shoes better than any other human on planet Earth. This is what I thought they would look like in 20 years. I love it. Can I take a picture of them, actually? Dude, I'm so hyped. You killed it. Yo, what's your IG? Sean's now a full-blown influencer. Last year, Nike chose him to design his own sneaker. 
which instantly sold out. And there's another one on the way with Guess. It's vegan. So sick. I wish I had a clean pair like this, honestly. That's supposed to be a swoosh mouth. <laughs> thank you. I love it. Thank you Appreciate so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. How's business? Yearly? Uh, for like, I don't know, just like a random number to throw out there. We'll probably do like upwards of like 10 million a year. Turns out the number is closer to 20 million. Sean's easygoing disposition can make it seem like this was all a happy accident. But new storefronts are coming in Chicago, Houston, and internationally. And there are conversations happening about their YouTube show moving to a bigger platform. You're going to be recycling a hell of a lot of Yeah, <laughs> old we're recycling clothes. a lot of clothes. <laughs> we're selling a lot of used clothes. <laughs> <laughs>